This is a one speaker meeting. Please welcome our speaker tonight, Bogey. Hi everybody, my name is Bogey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. For those of you listening at home, I'm about six feet four, about 225 pounds, and I'm built like a Mack truck. At least when I'm drinking. Uh, you know, it's funny that this thing's being recorded because Dave, who records, has given me over the years, you know, upwards of 50 or 60 CDs. And I travel for a living, and I don't, I'm all over the world, and a lot of times I can't get to meetings. And those CDs have saved my ass. You know, I, I have just on my iPod 50 meetings, and I can pull one up a day when I'm on the road and just, you know, dial in and, and hear the message and, and, you know, hear somebody speak the language, and I can get back in touch with what it is we do here. And, um, you know, if you're new and you're wondering, just what the hell is it we do here? <laughs> I can tell you for me, it's about growth and it's about love. And uh, I knew nothing of either one of those before I got here. Um, and I know a whole hell of a lot more now, but I still am learning you know, more every day. And, uh, and it's a really, really great thing. So since there were 1,000 birthdays and 300 million chips, um, I have approximately 25 minutes, which is awesome for me. Um, but um, congratulations to all the chip takers and all the birthdays. I mean, those milestones were, were so key for me early on. My sobriety date was November 27th of 1990. Um, yeah. <laughs> God had a lot to do with it. <laughs> I had very little to do with it. Um, you know, at, at, at that point, I was, uh, yeah, I was three years old. No. Um, everybody does that to me. Everybody does that. No. Um, I was 18. I'm 38 now. Um, I'll be 20 or sober in November if I'm willing. You, all, you always hear that, God willing. God's willing. I got to be willing. This is up to me to do the deal. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and it's interesting because that week, this year, I'm going to be playing a show in my hometown at the big place to play in Greenville, South Carolina, where I grew up. And my family's going to be there. And it's going to be this whole thing. And you know, for me, my dad went, my dad went crazy. He bought like the first four rows of tickets and you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and he's very proud. And that's you know, a huge thing for me. It's, it's a real milestone in our relationship. Um, you know, but, I, but I kept getting emails like every day, like, where are your comp seats going to be? And all this kind of stuff. And I was like, dude, just another day for me, please. I can't, I can't get into the head trip of the whole thing. It has to be just another day and just another gig. Granted, it's going to be a special night. But at the end of the day, I wake up, I put one foot in front of the other, I do what's in front of me, and you know, I just try and do the best I can live in God's will that I know of. And that's been the deal that I have, have had with myself ever since I got here. Um, so like I said, Greenville, South Carolina, you can probably hear that every now and then and you know how I talk and stuff. But um, if, if the air was humid here, it would be a lot thicker. You know, it'd be like, you know, I'd talk a little slower. I'd probably need 40 minutes, you know, um, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so it's there. So I have, the, I have the southern upbringing. And you know, in the south, you're basically born with a bottle of bourbon and a pack of Marlboros. And you know, they're like, here you go. Welcome to the world, kid. Um, and uh, I had a blast with that bottle of bourbon and that pack of Marlboros. Uh, I really did. You know, there, there were a lot of really great times. And you know, I, I drank alcoholically right out of the gate. Um, you know, my, my first drink was probably like hitting my dad's you know, screwdriver or something when I was you know, fourth or fifth grade or something like that and going, man, that tastes terrible. You know, why do you drink that? And he's like, oh, one day you'll understand, kid. You know, and <laughs> sooner than he knew. Um, but I, uh, yeah, right around 13, I was in eighth grade. And you know, I had all those alcoholic traits. I really did. I was not comfortable with who I was. Um, that's an understatement. I really didn't like who I was. Uh, I didn't like who I thought you thought I was, right? And therefore, I had to change who I was. And I didn't know how to do it um, on a real level. You know, I really didn't. So what I did was I found something that made me feel better. 
and that was booze. Now, the first time I drank, again, alcoholically, I wasn't playing. I drank Everclear. Oh. Yeah, it was like, here we go, we're in. It was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. I drank way too much of that stuff, which, you know, probably was about an ounce. Um, but I really did. I drank way too much of that stuff. I felt dull. I felt heavy. I felt like there was this weight on my forehead and my brain, and I couldn't really see right. And it didn't feel good. But the alcoholic part of me that was already there, because I, I truly believe I had all this stuff going on even before I drank, you know, I got sick. I threw up. It was not a good experience. But I woke up the next day going, you know, I really need to figure out how to do that better. I did. I, I, I really, I was like, everybody tells me how great this is, and everybody obviously knows better than I do, so I need to figure out how to do that. So I spent the next five and a half years seeking how to find that out, you know, and there were a couple of years where I found the balance, and it was magical, and it was great, and it got me out of myself, and I had, you know, I didn't have any, like, social anxiety. I could be happy and free with everybody. I had all that stuff. Then it became a tool for living. And that's when it was pretty much over as far as the happiness goes. Because once it became a tool for living, all those feelings that I was dealing with were on my mind. And I started drinking and using to get rid of those feelings and for, to, to cope with that kind of stuff. Um, what were the feelings? I was scared to death. I was scared of you. I'm not 6'4". I'm not 225. I wish I was. And when I was 15, 16, 17, I was nowhere near what I am now. Um, which, just because we're being honest, I'm 5'11", I weigh 150 pounds. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I know you're like, wow, man, this guy's eating. No, anyway. So, um, yeah, uh, Lou Ferrigno, I'm not. Um, so I, uh, I always had that less than thing, and I never had anything that made me feel comparable to you. I really didn't. Um, you know, I was pretty good at some sports. I was an okay student. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was smart enough and everything. I didn't apply myself. There's nothing alcoholic about that. Um, but, you know, I, I really, I just, I didn't like who I was. I wasn't, you hear it all the time in here, I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. And that was me. You know, it really was. I felt smaller than everybody even when I was bigger. And, you know, even to this day with 19 plus years of sobriety, there are times that I still feel smaller than everybody. I feel like I'm coming from behind. I feel like I've got to be, you know, twice as good as anybody just to be average. And um, alcohol and drugs really helped me with that for a while. And then they stopped. And I would be loaded and I would still feel miserable. And I knew that this wasn't working anymore, and I didn't know what to do because it was my only tool. It was all I had. You know, like I said, recognition from my peers, from my parents, from sports, from anything, from music, didn't get it. Didn't get it. Helped me a little bit. Didn't touch in here. And one thing I've learned is it's not about all this out there. It's about this in here. And from being in here and doing the steps and getting in touch with the God of my understanding, I've learned how to to deal with this stuff in here. And, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for that. And I'm so great. You know, I said I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. I am very much so. Because I didn't know what the hell the matter was with me before. Now I know. And I've got a program of action to take care of that stuff. So um, it went pretty much like this. Eighth grade, you know, pot, drinking, stuff like that. Um, you know, ninth grade, same thing. Again, drinking alcoholically, not obviously every day because I had to have some semblance of, you know, parental <laughs> guidance. <laughs> and, um, you know, I had to fool some people some of the time and, you know, all that stuff. But let me tell you something. From that, again, from that first day, I wanted to figure out how to do it right. And once I figured out how to do it right, I wanted to do it every day. If I couldn't, want, if I couldn't do it every day, I was really wanting to do it every day. I wanted that relief that it brought just like that, you know. And once... <laughs> So eighth grade and ninth grade went pretty well, if you want to look at underachieving as pretty well. Um, <laughs> and so my folks were like, well, and oh, by the way, let me give you a little, a little family history. Okay, so my folks are divorced when I'm like four and a half, five years old. I live with mom. Uh, Pop remarries, uh, wonderful woman. They're still together. Mom remarries, wonderful guy. They're still together. Um, I have two sisters. And then when my mom remarried, I got four more. 
and they're all older. So I'm the youngest, and I'm the only boy of seven. Um, so you learn a few things about women that way. You learn how to treat them, and you learn how not to treat them. My problem is that I confuse the two on a fairly regular basis. Um, so, um, you know, but there were, there were so many times when, because, you know, all of my sisters were very, you know, smart and, you know, they achieved and, and they did, you know, they did their deal and, you know, they, well, obeyed my parents and, and that kind of stuff. None of them really bucked the system. I was going to take care of that in spades. Uh, so I did in the eighth and ninth grade and, and my grades weren't very good and they were worried about me, you know, getting into college and things like that. And so my dad said, well, I've got a great idea. I went to this boarding school when I was young and it was perfect for me. It'll be good for him and that's where you're going to go. So I went to boarding school for 10th and 11th grade. If you put a bunch of kids <laughs> in the middle of nowhere with the parents' money, and very little supervision or, you know, at least knowledge of the kids, stuff's going to happen. <laughs> and not necessarily good, wholesome stuff. Nope. That's where the drug thing really took over for me because everybody was there and everybody was doing things. And, you know, I had always said, I'll never do this. I'll never do that. Like, I never wanted to do acid and I never wanted to do coke and all that kind of stuff. Well, that first year at boarding school, we took right on care of that. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I remember a friend of mine asking me, you know, do you feel any peer pressure? This is when I was a couple of years sober. He's like, do you feel any peer pressure or anything? And I'm like, no. The pressure's internal. It's not from anybody else. It's from in here. It's this stuff that I got to take care of that, that provides the pressure. So, you know, nobody ever came up to me and went, dude, you're doing this now. I went, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and so I got into it. And you know, so 10th and 11th grade, I was all in it. I never did crack. I never did heroin. Those were lines that I drew. Obviously, the lines on the coke and the acid never worked out for me. The reason I never did crack or never did heroin, I never had the opportunity. <laughs> okay? I wasn't around it. It just wasn't there. Um, if you're a crackhead, if you're a junkie, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. We're all here for you. The, the steps will work the same for you as they have for everybody else in this room. I've known it my whole sobriety. My first sponsor, junkie. My second sponsor, drunk. You know, the whole deal. I mean, they're, these steps are universal. They can work for people outside of addiction and alcoholism as well. There are programs for that too. Um, and it's, it's a really beautiful thing to watch somebody, you know, in here or out there, start working this thing and that light come on in their eyes and their lives change. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So. Um, Around the middle of the 11th grade, I started going, you know, I think I might be doing this stuff too much. Because it was. And because it had become my tool for living. And I saw this, I sought out this guidance counselor and I talked to her about it. And, um, and she sent me to uh, this clinic in town. And uh, the boarding school was in Virginia, in Lynchburg. And so uh, she sent me to this clinic and I met with, the, with a uh, therapist there. You know the place? You went to Hargrave, didn't you? No, that's, no, I didn't. I had to wrestle those jackasses, though. Um, but, <laughs> no, I went to VES. But, so she's up there going, I know, I was on it. So uh, anyhow, uh, I went to this evaluation, and I, I'm, I'm honest with the, with the guy. I don't know why, but I was. And he says, well, and at the end of it, I'm like, so what do you think? You know, Is there something very wrong with me? And he's like, well, you're a nice bike. Um, he says, you're a borderline case. And I didn't really dig the sound of that at all. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, well, you can either keep doing what you're doing and it's a phase and you'll grow out of it, or you can keep doing what you're doing and you can become chemically dependent. And I really didn't like the sound of chemically dependent. That wasn't on my agenda of things I want to be when I grow up. So I stopped. I, I drank like a fish, but I stopped doing the drugs. And that lasted I don't know, maybe three months. And then I was at Berkeley in Boston for a summer session up there. And, you know, I was, I was blackout drinking the whole time. I mean, you know, really fun stuff. And, uh, you know, 17, walking around the streets of Boston, not knowing my ass from a hole in the ground, hammered. Not a good idea. You know, from the South, no less. You know, where I come from, everybody's like, hey, how you doing on the street? Everybody in Boston's like, fuck you. You know, I'm like, okay. So, you know, but I mean, it's just, it was, 
I, I didn't know anything about the world or what I was doing. So, uh, and I was out with these guys one night, and they're getting high, and they passed it to me, and I just went, absolutely, you know. And so I started getting high again, and that lasted all the way through my senior year. Now here's here's the rub. When that counselor told me that chemically dependent thing, I went home to my family that summer, and I told them, and I said, look, I don't want to be doing this shit anymore, and I don't want to go back to that boarding school because I really think that that is not going to help me, you know, stay clean. And my dad and my mom were like, okay, you can come home and go to school here again. And I was like, okay. And so I did. And within a month of me being back in Greenville, I was doing the same stuff I was doing at boarding school. Geographics don't work. Um, it would be really great if they did, but they don't. So, you know, my senior year, I, I kept doing the same stuff. And then I went to college, and I lasted all of three months. And at the end of those three months, the dean called me into his office, and he said, you know, son, you can go home now. And I went, but I haven't taken exams yet. <laughs> and he goes, you're not going to pass. My response, but I haven't taken my exams yet. He goes, son, you don't understand. We do freshman grade tracking. Every class you miss, we take a point off your average. You could make 1,000 on your exams, and you're still not going to pass. So we're going to let you withdraw, save your GPA. I think you have some problems you need to take care of. Why don't you go home and take care of it, and then you can come back. And I went, and I walked to my girlfriend's house at the time, mortified. And she opened the door and I just bust into tears. You know, I was humiliated. I had utterly failed. And I went up on her bed and I'm laying there by myself and I'm looking at the ceiling and I said it. I said, God, just get me out of this. Just, just, I don't know what I'm doing. Just get me out of this. I had no idea that a week later he was gonna get me out of it by getting me into treatment, but that's what happened. So I went home, and this is, this is one of my favorite stories to tell, and then I'll get into the recovery part of it. But um, I went home, and I had a meeting with my dad and my mom at my dad's office. My dad's a stockbroker. He's a very much by the book, by the numbers kind of guy. And he's like, well, you know, here's what's going to happen. You're going to live at your mom's. You're going to follow her. My dad, remember, bourbon, Marlboros. You're going to live with your mom. You're going to do this right here. You're going to follow her rules. You're going to have to, you know, here's what's going to happen if you don't live with your mom. You're going to have to get a job. You're going to make X amount. He's got a graph, like in a dry erase board. He's got a dry erase board in his office with my life on it. You know, option A, get a job and pay rent and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, he's got all my expenses broken down. And he's like, so you got your car insurance, you got your health insurance, you got your medicines you need every month, you got gas in the car, you got rent. You got, okay, well, Bogue, it looks like, you know, after everything's said and done, you've pretty much, well, you're going to have about 200 bucks in the hole and you haven't even eaten yet. <laughs> now, here's the nasty part of the disease. I didn't care. I didn't care. I didn't care that the guy in front of me loved me enough to try and help me. I didn't care that my mom was sitting over there basically in tears trying to help. I didn't care. I was so self-absorbed and self-centered, nothing mattered but me. And that continues to this day sometimes. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, it really, it was like that. And, and he goes, son, just what is your problem? And I looked at him with all my 18-year-oldness and my attitude. And I said, what do you think it is? And he said, is it alcohol and drugs? And I said, yeah, it is. And that was the second time in my life I'd ever been honest. And the, the tone of the conversation completely changed at that point. It was, look, we'll get you help. We'll do whatever we got to do. You know, he took it very seriously, and so did my mom. And, you know, I was like, no, it's cool. I got it. I'll take care of it. Not a problem. Of course, I just said it was a problem, but now it, no, it's not. No. Nah. <laughs> You're helping me is going to be a big problem. I'm uh, so, so the next, the next, uh, I guess that was right before Thanksgiving, and uh, that Monday, um, I went to meet with a family friend that was a doctor, and I went and I found myself being completely honest with him. He was telling me all about, you know, 
you know, his excursions in school and, you know, what he did. He's like, yeah, I majored in girls and fraternities and, you know, drinking and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, me too. And, you know, and, and we're just talking like two alcoholics talk. He was 12-stepping me and I had no idea. And he said, let's take a ride. And he said, I want you to see this place. And, and we went to a treatment center and we did like a walkthrough and I met the head guy there and and they were really not. Again, I found myself being completely honest with him. And they looked at each other and they said, what do you think to each other? And Dick Donovan and George Grimble, they're, George has passed away, but George said, you know, I think he did this with his hand and made kind of a downward slide and a flattening out thing, for those of you on the tape. Um, <laughs> I haven't forgotten you at home, trust me. I, I love you guys. Um, and, uh, and I was like, I was like, what does that mean? You know, what's that motion with your hand? What, what is that? He goes, well, son, we think you've bottomed out. And, and I was like, well, what does that mean? And Dick looks at me and he goes, we think you're ready to make a change. And we want to help you do that. And I went, oh, well, that doesn't sound so bad. And so then we got in the car. Dr. Grimble and I got in the car and we went back to his house. And we're on the way there. And, and he goes, so what do you think? I said, I think that place is fantastic for people that need it. <laughs> I'm obviously not one of them, you know. And he, and he said, he said, well, why don't you think you need it? And I said, I can take care of this. I said, I've taken care of it before. <laughs> and he said, no. He said, he said, well, how are you going to do it? I said, I'm just going to stop, and then I'll go back to college, and I'll be fine. And he said, you can't do it, son. And I was like, why not? What, what are you talking about? And he goes, you can't do it. I know you can't do it. I was like, how the hell do you know I can't do it? I haven't seen this man, you know, I was, like he was, we went across the street from him when I was like two. Um, and I was like, I haven't seen you in 16 years. How the hell do you know who I am? He goes, you can't do it because I couldn't do it. And you and I are a lot alike. And I said, well, sorry to hear that, but I'm not going to that place. And I went home. And what did I do, y'all? I spent the rest of the afternoon getting loaded. That's what we do when we're in distress or pain or celebrating or whatever. Um, you know, man, this sucks. I need a drink. Man, this is awesome. This is great. I need a drink. I mean, it's just what we do. So I, uh, I spent the rest of the afternoon getting loaded. I got home. My mom answers the door with the phone in her hand. She goes, your dad's on the phone. wants to talk to you. And dad says, well, We've been talking to Dr. Grimble and think you need to go to this place, so tomorrow you're going to go to this place. And I was like, the hell I am. And he goes, no, son, you're going. I'm, the hell I am. And it went back and forth for a couple of times. And then, and then he said the following phrase. And this is really kind of God just poking me in the chest. He said, son, we think you need to, know, you th we think you need to go. Dr. Grimble thinks you need to go. And you know you need to go. And that really resonated because I did. I knew I needed to go. He said, so why don't you just go? And so I said, okay, I'll go. And he said, then, it's not going to do you to, any good to go out and get ape shit tonight either. <laughs> Why don't you just take it easy? <laughs> so the first thing that comes to my head is bullshit. I'm going out in style. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I went out in classic alcoholic fashion. You know, I, I, I drank too much. I threw up behind a dumpster. You know, I probably offended some people. And, I'm, <laughs> and I made it home a little late. There you go, you know. Or maybe, no, I was actually, I was on time. Because I remember my mom was sitting up waiting for me. And she said, you okay? And I said, yeah, and I'm on time. And you better remember that. <laughs> it's like, why do alcoholics want credit for the most mundane shit? <laughs> to this day, I want somebody there beside me when I tie my shoes to go, man, you tied the shit out of those things. I mean, it's like... I really do. I want validation. It's, it's part of my disease. It really is. The good news is, guys, I went to this treatment center. I went to this treatment center, and that thing happened that happens here. Um, I had that moment of surrender, that moment of clarity, that moment when, you know, all of a sudden everything I was doing didn't make sense, and everything people were telling me would work for me, did. And I had this, you know, argument with my counselor and I was really pissed off. He had asked me what I wanted to do. 
when I got out of treatment and I said, well, I want to go back to college. I want to be in the fraternity and I want to be in this band that we were putting together and I want to stay sober. And he goes, you can't do that. You can't do any of that. And I went, then what the hell are you asking me for? I was so offended, you know, and what he was talking about was you can't do any of that stuff if you don't put the sobriety first. Because I went back to college, and I was in the fraternity, and I was in that band, and I stayed sober. But I'm, I made sobriety first, and I did those steps. At three months, I did my first four step. At eight months, I did another one with a different sponsor because I had moved from Greenville to Chapel Hill where I went to school. And I continued to do them on a regular basis. I cleaned up the wreckage of my past. I, I started to change who I was, and I started to become who I wanted to be. And that's all about the steps and all about God. That whole main, maintenance of a spiritual condition is key. You know, having had a spiritual awakening is the result of the steps. That's the whole point of the deal is your spiritual awakening. You work the steps, you will have the spiritual, your spirit will awaken. And when you do that, things change. Your character changes. You know, it talks about in the 12 and 12, what we have to undergo is a change in character. And that's what I had to have. You know, I couldn't be that scared 18-year-old punk anymore. You know, I sometimes still feel like that. I really do. I still feel terrified a lot of times. I mean, the music business is not a stable thing. I've been steadily working for the last six years. I've been on the road and going to meetings out there on the road, and I've been touring nine months out of each year. It's been a real blessing. It's been amazing. And I've been to meetings in Japan, in Switzerland, um, London, Madrid, I mean, all Amsterdam, all over the place. I took my 19-year coin in Amsterdam, and then the next day I flew to Tel Aviv, and I took one there. My grandmother, my dad's mom, is 30-something years sober now. And last Christmas, I went to her. To, I went to see her. She's in an assisted living place. She's still sharp as all hell, too. She's awesome. She just turned 90. Um, and I was just back there in, in August to, to see her for her birthday. But I went back for Christmas, and I told her about going to that meeting in Tel Aviv, and I gave her that medallion. And I said, they gave me this, and I want you to have it because we share this. And there's a few of us in the family that do. And it's a really beautiful thing. There's a few of us in the family that don't, and it's a really ugly thing. You know, I'm very, very blessed, you know, that, that I have this thing and that I got it, you know, so young. If you're young and here, you don't, if you haven't been out yet, you don't have to go out. I didn't go back out. I stayed. It doesn't have to happen. A lot of people go out. It's part of their story. It's okay. Just if you made it back, stick around. You don't know if you're going to get back. I've had two guys that I sponsored out here go out and die. And they were young and thought they could do it. And it fucked me up bad. I don't care how much, I don't care how much al -Anon you've had. If you care about somebody like we do in here, because we do, we care about people in here. That's what we learn how to do. If you care about somebody and you're trying to help them and they go out and they die, it hurts like shit, you know? And so I'm telling you, if you're new and you don't have a sponsor, please get one. If you're too afraid to ask, just talk to some friends around here. Look for the people that have what you want, people that feel centered, that feel solid. Those are the people you want to be with in here. So, you know, anyway, so I share this kind of thing with my family and stuff, and, and it's been an amazing experience. But the steps are really what this thing's about. This meeting is on the coins. There's the triangle and the circle. Unity, service, recovery, right? The meeting is unity. That's where we all get together and we're here. I hear you. And I got five minutes. They don't. They don't. <laughs> that clock's wrong. <laughs> you see the clock that's wrong. Yeah. Okay. Just so I've established that I'm right and the clock's wrong. <laughs> I appreciate the heads up though. I'm sorry about that. All right. Um, those pesky birthdays. Um, <laughs> So anyway, the meetings are unity, the steps, the book, the program, that's recovery, service, helping the meetings run, sponsoring people, that's the other part. You have to have all three. You have to. Please do this for yourselves. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. 
and thank you all for being here for me. I'm really Ooh. glad to be here. Thank you.